Okay. Okay, so the first thing I'm doing before I watch the Twin Peaks finale is I'm going to watch this uh, interview they did on the Phil Dinahue show. This was a couple days before the season finale aired. So people who have watched this interview would have seen the first, uh, the rest of the season except for the finale. So there, I'm sure there won't be any spoilers moving forward. That would be stupid. They wouldn't do that. But uh, this is really cool. This is, you know, this is like a 30-year-old thing. I guess it aired in uh, May 21st, 1990. So yeah, 32 years ago. But um, I like this uh, in the moment, what people thought at the time, what questions they were asking at the time, what the theories were. Maybe we'll get a couple little tidbits, some things I didn't pick up on. Maybe they'll give us an answer or two. If nothing else, it'll just be interesting to see these actors out of character because with the exception of one actor, no, two, Ray Wise, I haven't seen any of these other actors in anything that I'm aware of. Like it's 30 years ago, maybe they've aged up and I've seen them and I just don't recognize them. But uh, Ray Wise and the guy who plays uh, the FBI agent, those are the only two actors that I'm aware of. So it'll be interesting to see the rest of these out of character. But I'm not going to do a full reaction to this. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to record myself watching it. But I don't have time to edit. I don't have time to sync sound to it and all that shit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause at various points and give my commentary, you know, anything I think is, is interesting, if anything, you know, and just give my thoughts on it. So I like that they're doing the theme song music as they come on. That's pretty, it's simple, but it's good. I like it. So this is who we're working with. Huh? No FBI agent. I'm actually kind of disappointed. Yeah, Phil just said he thinks uh, her character's husband committed to murder. Like, there's no fucking way. I will never believe that. Like, no, it's, he's at the bottom of my list. <laughs> he's too obvious. Phil just said again he thinks this son bitch is a killer. He, he's too obvious. I just don't believe it. Big red ass Aaron is what he is. He just mentioned who shot JR. Just saying that like that was a big deal back then. And probably it's for some people it probably doesn't even resonate. But back then it was a big deal. Just an aside here, I wonder if Phil Donahue had some kind of like reading disability of some sort, like dyslexic or something, because he was stumbling bad when he was reading these bios. Like he, I was like, I was actually sitting there thinking like, I remember watching him as a kid. I don't remember him sucking ass, but I was like, this guy sucks ass. But now that he's not reading, now that he's talking, it's very smooth. So he must have some kind of reading disability. <laughs> They're talking about her lying in the rain. That's terrible work, man. Nowadays we'd use a, a dummy, right? As a dead body, I mean, lying in the rain is a dead body. One thing I did remember is uh, Phil Donahue is a horned dog. He's hitting on this uh, lawyer actress really fucking bad, like really strong. He's trying to smash. So I did did remember about even when I was a kid. I was like, damn, dude, damn. <laughs> um, Jesus, I forgot they had calls too. Fucking hell, like I hate calls. I assume they're more heavily screened here than they are on radio. Although this is pre-recorded, so they would cut out a terrible ass phone call. Thank God. Because I hate sports radio. Because anytime it's like, let's go to the phones. I'm like, let's switch channels. But also, he just fucked up the names of the actors. And again, I, th I wonder if it's a reading disability. He's going off a card. But he called Match and he called uh, her Dana. When Dana's the guy, right? And so, he's not coming. I used to have, as a kid, what I remembered, I thought Phil Donahue was awesome. So far, he's not coming off too well here. <laughs> like, Jesus, dude. He's trying to smash the actress. He can't read off a card. And he doesn't know the fucking actor names. It's super awkward. Now they're going to phone calls. My God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. They're mentioning this serial killer plot line that just kind of got dropped after the first episode, too. I, I don't know. They haven't answered it yet. I think what happened was they needed to use serial killer to justify an FBI agent investigating the case. Because if it's just a murder and it's not a serial killer, there's no reason for the FBI to be there. So that was their segue. And once they got into it, they got we got deer heads on tables. 
We had women talking to logs. We got uh, reverse talking, dancing small people. And we're people following their dreams. So who gives a shit, essentially? You know, I think it, I think they said, fuck, fuck logic and reason. We don't need to justify why the FBI is investigating this. And they dropped it. That's my opinion. Now we'll see what they say the answer is. They're mentioning... The Dana actor, by the way, seems like a moron. He seems like a very nice guy, but he doesn't seem very smart. But uh, they're saying it's like in the entire course of what we've had so far, it's only been three or four days. Let me think about that. I think uh, each episode has been a day, from my understanding. Although there was one sequence of episodes where they talked about something was going to happen at night, and then that didn't happen until the next day. But we've definitely had... Maybe it's because we've only seen the, the FBI agent wake up and get coffee three times so far. But it, to me, if you would ask me, I would have said each episode is a day. It's probably a little bit less than that. We've had seven episodes. The pilot was two episodes long. So, so yeah, I think I think it's been just a couple of, I think it's been probably five days, maybe. They said they're not too sure. They're saying three or four days. But, like, it's a good point, though. Like, not a whole lot of time has actually passed. It just feels like a long time. So they shot the pilot in Washington State. Then they went to, um, then they went to California. So I was like, now he's trying to smash her. Jesus, dude. He needs to calm down. Somebody throw some cold water on this son bitch. You know, one thing funny, Dana just says, I don't want to sound like every other actor, but the cast is really awesome. He said this 32 years ago. It was a stereotype trope back then. It's a stereotype cliche trope now. They always say that. What else are you going to say, right? Like, you know, yeah. Oh, this is interesting. They're saying when they shot the finale... The season one finale, they didn't get the last couple of pages of scripts, so nobody knows what's going to happen. I assume only the actor in the scene, the actor or actors in the scene, got the last couple of pages. That's going to be interesting to look at. I'm going to be watching the season finale right after I watch this. I tell you, this is getting me really excited for it. What's interesting is they said that, like, you know, they shot the pilot in Washington, and they were just talking about how all the sets were duplicated. Like, they shot in sets in Washington State, and they duplicated all the sets in California, you know, Los Angeles. For the rest of the series. And I'll tell you what. I can't tell. I didn't see any difference. It felt the same. They did a great job of duplicating the sets. And you see this all the time. Uh, I think Buffy. The first season they actually shot in the house. Or first three seasons. You know Buffy's house. They shot on location. They shot in a, in a residence. right? And then they weren't allowed to come back. After the season three finale. Because they blew up uh, the, the school. And there was loud explosions. And. Everybody in town was pissed off at him, so they weren't allowed to come back and do exterior shots or do, you know. So they duplicated her house for the last four seasons, you know. And so that's why you don't really see her house much in season four. You know, you see like a bedroom, and maybe I think you get the living room once or twice, maybe the kitchen or something, not very much. And then, like, you know, in season five and stuff, you start seeing that because I think they were kind of surprised that they weren't allowed to come back and they didn't have the budget to build the set. So, you know, they probably redressed some stuff. But. Every now and then, they, you have to do that. I think also the Vampire Diaries is the same thing. They end up having to build the house that they use on the set. Um, but this was this is remarkable. Like, you know, because I can't remember a single time I was watching these episodes where I felt like, wow, this doesn't look like the police station. Or But maybe, though, that's why. Remember I said the deer head was back in the wall and it didn't make any sense it's back in the wall because there's not enough room in, that, in, in the conference room? Maybe it's because that was a different location. I think the deer head was in the pilot. I'm pretty sure. But yeah, they did a great job making those sets. You know, it's interesting. He asked this question because this was a big deal back then. Actors did not want to work TV. There was a stigma in working TV. If you were a movie actor and you started doing TV, people felt like your career was going down. It was downhill, right? That was a step down. You start in TV and you go to movies and you don't go back. Maybe every now and then you do a cameo on something or you do a guest star for one episode. But you don't work as a regular in TV. That was the situation 32 years ago. You know who changed it? Kiefer Sutherland, 24. 2004, or no, 2001. Um, he was a washed up movie actor. He could, you know, his movies were bombing. He, he was a little difficult on set because he's super intense. You know, great actor, but super intense. And so he was a little bit of trouble to work with him with some people. So he just wasn't getting any movie roles. So he said, fuck, man. So he went to TV. And 24 was so good. 
and it blew up so much that 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 really did reverse the curse. Because here's the thing, with David Duchovny and Julian Anderson, they blew up because of uh, X-Files, but they started in TV and they went into movies. But those were two others that, that, that were returned to TV, you know, Californication and stuff like that. And they just, I think it was Kiefer Sutherland, really, with 24, who washed away the stigma. And he's, he's saying, do you think this shows prestige television is essentially what he's talking about? They didn't have that word back then. But And I think another thing helped was Sopranos. I think it came out around 2001, same time, 24 and Sopranos. Sopranos being prestige TV. Made there by huge stars. Everybody wanted to be on it. You had all these fucking great guest stars came on Sopranos. And Sopranos, I think it was the other one. Sopranos in 24 turned TV into prestige. It turned TV to be as big as movies. Now, if an actor's movie career had failed, they would go back to TV to burnish off their career and get become big again and then go back to movies. Especially when the salary started, started becoming, you could make a hell of a lot of money in, in, in TV. You started getting massive salaries... And another thing that helped, I think, was CGI and special effects became cheaper and easier to do. You can get movie quality special effects in certain kinds of genres. So there's a lot of things combined. But it may be like for some people, younger people, they may not even realize that it was ever a thing that like you were embarrassed to work in TV if you were an actor. You're like, you know, the young up and coming actor is fine. But, you know, you make your bones in TV and then you go to the movies. But but there was a time when there was a massive stigma. So that's why, one of the biggest reasons I wanted to watch this, because it's a, you're stepping back in time. You're seeing ideas. And some of these questions are really stupid. Questions no audience would ask today because you just didn't know very much back then. You didn't have the internet. You couldn't, you didn't have all these behind the scenes documentaries on the internet. You didn't have DVD bonus features where actors sit down and talk about their performance, their audio commentaries. You didn't have any of this stuff that gave the average fan access to what actually happens in the making a TV show and a movie. So some of these questions are so basic, like, what are your hours like? When do you get your scripts? Like, really, you nowadays, they'd be stupid questions. But back then, it just shows there were, you didn't have access back then. You didn't know how this shit was done because it, the information just wasn't out there. She's talking about how um, it, she doesn't know what a sociologist would say, but people like gathering together and talking about the show. She's basically talking about water cooler television. And we hadn't really had water cooler television since Dallas was big. Once, you know, Who Shot JR was the biggest water cooler moment. Like, I didn't even watch Dallas back then. That's what got me to start watching Dallas. Because all summer long, motherfuckers were talking about Who Shot JR. It's like, holy shit, right? And so, 85 or 86, maybe, it was somewhere in the, the late 80s, they did this stupid thing where Patrick Duffy came back and it was all a dream, and that just killed Dallas. Just killed it. Like, they shed viewers by the millions because they made that decision. And, and from then until Twin Peaks, I don't think there was really a water cooler show that everybody talked about. I don't remember when Moonlighting was. Moonlighting was a water cooler, cooler show. It may have been around this same time period. I can't remember. It may have been shortly after this. It may have been before. It's, but that was a water cooler show. But there weren't many water cooler shows back then. Again, I think it was uh, stuff like The Sopranos and X-Files. X-Files is probably the next big one. And then Buffy became one for y the younger generation. And then, of course, this became one for, like, all generations. There's the deer head. You're goddamn right. Mandatory. That sounded like the actress... Uh, yeah, we're not sending a postcard, motherfucker. That sounded like the actress who played, uh, what's her name? Lucy, I think. Uh, they, they got her recording live. We'll be back after these messages. <laughs> I think that was her. <laughs> Excellent. They, they just He just announced they've been picked up. <laughs> I wonder if he told the actress before the cameras came back on. Oh, okay, it is. He said it's the first they've heard of it. Why are you here? She said... She's a moron. She's here in the audience at Dinahue for talking about, like, this is for Twin Peaks, right? This is the Dinahue episode for Twin Peaks. She's never seen it. Why are you here? This she's talking about, well, will there be reruns in the, in the summer? Yeah, that was another thing. You, could, you didn't have streaming back then. No Netflix. If you wanted to watch the show from the beginning, there better be reruns, right? Boy, TV sucked. Back, you know, I know I sound like an old man screaming in the cloud, but TV sucked back then. Man, I wouldn't trade now for any time period in history, man. Here she is. Here's another person who's never seen the show. What the hell's wrong with you? 
Oh, shit. Fantastic. This is interesting. They made several different endings depending on whether or not they were picked up or whether this was it. They were canceled, right? That's interesting. That's very interesting because... And he was told here, and they're talking about Wednesday night, so this, when did this maybe have been Mon the Monday episode? Most likely because they would say tomorrow night. If um, So this is either the Thursday, Friday be before that weekend, you know, the next week, or the Monday. Because if this had aired on Tuesday... They would have said tomorrow night. No, they're saying Wednesday night at ten, right? So this is either this is probably Monday. It came out, right? That would make sense. You want to, you want this episode to air, you know, um, a couple days because you're promoting the finale. You want big numbers for the finale, right? So you want the episode to this Danny Hugh episode to air a couple days before. So that means he just found. He says he just found out. Now, I don't know if I believe that or not. Maybe they told him the night before or something. He wanted to wait to say it on film. Who knows? But he said he just found out about the ending, which means they only had a couple days to plug in the correct ending. And the way you do that is, okay, say you have you know, the ending that, that's going to be different is 2 minutes and 34 seconds. Every one of your endings, your three endings, is going to be 2 minutes and 34 seconds. You pull it out, put it in. It'd be very easy. But somebody still has to do that. And they have to make sure it's right, make sure it's still seamless, make sure the time still works. Everything everything works, right? That takes a little time. So, like, there, you know, back then, in this day and age, when there were probably physical prints that were flying around the country or something, or I don't even know if they're beaming by satellite in 1990. So, man, that, that's that's pushing it, right? That's that is really pushing it. Wow, they just asked if Twin Peaks means breasts. She said, "What's the symbolism? Does Twin Peaks mean tits?" The way Phil Dyer just walked away from her when she said that. That is hilarious. He's saying two mountains. This bitch called in. And Mark, who's one of the directors, is sitting there. And this bitch says, you know, can the actors feel the difference when David Lynch... In other words, it's much better when David Lynch directs an episode than when Mark does, right? Yeah. And she said, I'm sorry, Mark, but can you... Well, wow, what a dick. Now, see, now I like callers. Because that's the first caller that's been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the, and see the actors can't say oh my god it's so much better when David directs because their other director and one of the showrunners is sitting right here you you have to be you have to be political here you, you can't give your what you really think right that's a very good political answer by this dumbass yeah I mean he's I call him, I just called him dumbass again I don't think he's dumb that was a very good answer he's, he he made the point David, you know, there's a bunch of directors. They said David directed three hours. I'm sure Mark directed, let's say, three. They had other directors. But the showrunners set the tone. They have what's called a tone meeting with a director. You bring a new director, say, you know, say you have 20 episodes a season. And say in those 20 episodes, there's 14 directors, okay? And so you've directed, you as a showrunner are going to direct some episodes, but you have these other 14 directors. You, with each director comes in, you have a tone meeting, Okay. We want these scenes, you know, in comedy, uh, it's say this is a drama, but you have comedic moments. I don't want any comedy on a scale of one to 10 to ever go above a six. You know, never make it below a three, so never make it so fucking serious people are weeping their eyes out, but never make it above a six. If it was uh, Stargate SG-1, for instance, sometimes the comedy can go to a seven. Don't ever make it an eight or more because that you're talking slapstick at that point, right? So that's in a very broad, generic sense. That's what a tone meeting is. But essentially, they go through every scene. Okay, here's the tone of the scene. Here's what we want. Here's how we want you to shoot. It won't, it won't say here's how we want you to shoot it, but here's what we want to feel in this moment, in this scene. Okay? We come into the scene feeling this. We leave the scene feeling that. That You have those tone meetings with the directors. So every director is going to feel similar. None of them are going to be able to do their own thing. You know, so they, they can bring their own th stuff to it. That's why you bring in other directors, but it will feel similar, right? So, and he kind of brought that up, which I, you know, in hearing the question, I didn't even think of that, but they're right. Like with, with Mark and David being the, the showrunners, it's all going to kind of feel like it's being directed by Mark and David, even when it's not. So that's interesting. Uh, David had a history with Kyle, you know, the FBI agent, and they wrote the part with him in mind. It's always dangerous to do that. What if you don't get the actor, right? But like it. it it's, it's always interesting, though, when they write the part with an actor in mind and then they get the actor, like, you know, because he's so perfectly suited for it. And that's why he's perfectly suited for it, because it was with him in mind. The twin swap theory. 
I was going to bring that up. You know, she's grinning about it. I was going to bring it up uh, that, you know, Laura isn't dead. She dressed up her twin. And the twin died and Laura's still alive playing the twin, right? Um, I I don't think so because when they wrote the pilot, I assume David Lynch had the killer in mind when he wrote the pilot. And they didn't have the twin in mind when they wrote the pilot. Reading between the lines of what everybody said here in this episode. They only came up with the idea of the twin after they shot the pilot. And they started going in the series. And then they said, let's bring this actress back. We really liked her work. Let's bring her back. Let's find a part for her. That's what I think happened. Which means they didn't know there was a twin when they wrote the pilot. So the twin can't be the killer, right? Or the murder victim or whatever. You can't do a switch. But by the way, how very Pretty Little Liars of you, right? It makes me wonder if the author for Pretty Little Liars was watching this episode of Phil Donahue and got the idea right then and there. Because that's literally what happens in Pretty Little Liars. Spoiler alert. This person asked, do you think you're setting new standard for the future of television? I think they did. Like I said, this, and then Sopranos later, you know, 10 years later, and um, X-Files set a new standard, I think. But this paved the way. This is one of the... If we were to go to the evolution of television as it exists now, I think you start with Twin Peaks. Because I mentioned Moonlighting. Moonlighting made people stars. It was a big cultural water cooler show. But it didn't pave any new ground. This paved new ground. Like you could make a, you could draw, draw a direct line from this. This is the grandfather of everything that's happening now. He just uh, confirmed what I was saying. He said the scripts rolled out as they were producing, right? So like they had the pilot episode written, they shot it, they went back in the writers' room and they broke the rest of the series. Which, by the way, is how Lost was done, right? You know, so that's why you can see differences between the Lost pilot and you know the rest of the season one and everything. So, um, that, that tells me again, it's not the twin, like, you know, it's not the twin swap theory is, is trash because, you know, they didn't know there was going to be a twin until they got into the series. That's fascinating. I got to wonder if it's true. I guess it is. I don't think you would lie. He said they had the FBI advisor for the pilot who then four weeks into the series, you know, when it was Aaron wrote him a letter and said, you know, some of the techniques you're talking about. J. Edgar Hoover used to uh, advise us to do, like, not necessarily th throwing rocks at bottles, but, like, following your dreams, stuff like that. J. Edgar Hoover was a very weird man. You should look into him sometime. Extremely fucking weird. Uh, probably, uh, you know, people talk about presidents being dictators. J. Edgar Hoover is probably the closest thing we ever had to a dictator in this country. Because, man, he had dirt on every president who was coming in, and the day they took office, he would go have a meeting with him. He'd show them what he has on him, and it would say, we're going we're gonna to keep you as FBI director. <laughs> he would just be, that's how he stayed in office for so fucking long. I don't even know how long. It was decades, right? But the incoming president, his first day in office, or maybe even during the transition, maybe it was even before he actually took office, he would have a meeting with him and say, look, you're going to keep me, right? You know, here's my folder of everything I've got on you. You're going to keep me as, as director, right? And they say, you're goddamn right I am. <laughs> Can you imagine what he had on Nixon? My God, man. But um, I don't remember when he died. I assume Nixon was president. When, you know, I think he died around that time. But uh, in fact, I think he died in office, J. Edgar Hoover. Because that's just what he wanted to do, right? <laughs> he was going to stay in charge of the FBI until he fucking died. But um, so it wouldn't shock me if he was telling agents to follow their dreams. He had all kinds of weird edicts. Like, you know, the dress code, the way they dress is still from him. You know, because that's just what he wanted them to do. You know, so... Um, for the, but personally, my opinion, not that I'm an expert on the FBI, but I don't think anything I've seen this agent do would actually happen in real life. But, you know, that's just me. <laughs> it doesn't make it any less entertaining, right? Yeah, see this? 17% no. Okay, so here's the thing. Psychiatrist is my number one suspect, even though, like, remember when I said I think he's about 40% who I think did it? I don't know. Somebody has to be above 50% for me to say I think they did it. So he's my number one suspect, but I, you know, I'm not convinced yet is what I'm saying. There's no way in hell it's Leo. It's not Jocks. Uh, it's not Bobby Briggs. So, so far, they're, they're you know... I, you know, I also think uh, Laura's father is a major suspect because that, that's why he's acting so fucking crazy, right? So, he's not on this list yet. Let's see. Huh. 
<laughs> Still alive, 6%. Hilarious. Oh, shit. Not the sawmill manager. You know who's not on this list? Yeah, the father. There it is. Mr. Palmer, the father. He's down at 3%. Suicide is interesting. What, did she wrap herself up in a fucking bag? Like, you're a moron. If you, if you voted suicide, you're a fucking moron. You know? Like, somebody was shot with a shotgun from across the room four times. Suicide might be ruled out. You know, that's kind of what you're talking about here. Jesus, dude. Um, you know who's not on this list is Josie. Because she's in such a periphery. It probably isn't her. It wouldn't make they've had no evidence and nothing pointing to her, which is why she's not on the list. But she does she's not even getting like two percent, you know. Maybe they'll show it here, but like that's you know, it's interesting. It just Josie just heard me. What wrapped herself in a bag. Josie, one percent. <laughs> one percent think one percent of these motherfuckers said it was the, the FBI agent. That would be some shit, wouldn't it? That would actually be fucking hilarious. That would be the best thing. He did it so that he could get his job here because he loved the place, right? He was driving through. He loved it. Okay, well, we need another case. I did this murder 10 years ago. I'm the serial killer. That would be interesting, actually. Never occurred to me. Never occurred to me. And Josie was 1%. So like I said, like she's going to be on there, but she's like really low. So interesting. The mayor, huh? He just thinks, he thinks it was the 85-year-old mayor <laughs> Dumbass. They ask uh, Mark Frost, uh, does he believe in psychic abilities and stuff like that? He said yes and no. I think every writer says yes and no. See, we don't believe in it. At least, well, I guess there's some writers do, but, but you know, I think most writers don't believe in it, but we want to believe in it. That I'll speak for myself. I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe in ESP. I don't believe in psychic abilities. I don't believe in any of this crap. But I want to believe. I want it to be real. I have an open mind. If you know, I there's a time when I, I've talked about this on Channel Four where I felt like I, I was in a haunted room where there was a ghost in that room with me. Like, but I can't prove it even to myself because there's other possible explanations. Because I didn't see anything. I just felt it. it was a feeling, right? Well, feelings can be deceiving, right? So you don't know. But I want to, right? I think that's where most writers are. So because they want to, and because they would, they have an open mind about it. They can write about it. You know, that allows you to write about it. If you're closed-minded, you probably couldn't write about it. While this moron talks about, are we sick of the Reagan area complacency? Okay. Um, they mentioned something before that I forgot to bring up. They said, most shows end with a cliffhanger and you're very intrigued. Like, you, the, the first, like, the first episode, the very last shot of the episode is a cliffhanger of some sort, right? And that gets you intrigued. This show started with a cliffhanger. And I, that's an interesting way to look at it. The mystery starts at the very beginning. What, what grips you happens at the very beginning. Kind of like with Game of Thrones. The very first scene of Game of Thrones is pretty gripping, right? <laughs> like, that gets you engaged. And then they don't return to it for a full 20 episodes. It's 20 episodes before you see the character, the White Walkers again, right? So, that this is this is interesting. Like and that's I do like that. I don't think it, it's a perfect analogy. I don't think they really start with the cliffhanger, but I think that is one of the things that like pe get people so engaged with the show. He's right about this one hundred percent. The the question was like uh, they show real grief on this show, Twin Peaks, like, and me having recently been through a grieving process myself. He says you know gr real grief doesn't just end conveniently by the next commercial, right? And maybe that's why I think Laura's father did it because he's he's experiencing real grief. We don't typically see it on TV even now, but you really didn't see it back then. You saw maybe a little, you know, 10 seconds of somebody grieving, crying, throwing something across the room, cut the commercial, come back, and they're fine, right? Because you've got to keep the story moving. You can't sit there and wallow in grief. It's uncomfortable. And the question was, that you, were you worried to make the audience uncomfortable? But he's like, they want to show real grief. That, that's another thing that was groundbreaking about this show, man. They show real grief. <laughs> they ask, are we ever going to meet Diane? He says, you're going to see parts of Diane in an upcoming episode. 
I'm very disappointed. I wanted Diane to be in his head, fucking head, man. I don't want to ever see Diane. I'm very disappointed. Parts of Diane. Probably like a hand on a phone or some shit. I don't want to meet Diane, man. This is this this is a crushing blow. I'm very disappointed. Yeah, very interesting. They said, um, until uh, Diane said, will we learn who killed Laura Palmer? And Mark Frost says, uh, you might, but will you believe the answer? Interesting. Very interesting. I like that. That's, that's so we're going to have to come to our own conclusions. Yeah. Prick. <laughs> this woman asked about <laughs> where he, uh, uh, Ray Wise jumps on the casket. And she said, was there any incest when that? He's like, uh, not when he was on the casket. <laughs> I guess they're trying to say, see, they're asking, was he raping his own daughter, right? And see, the reason they're asking that is because he's being fucking weird. And which makes me think he's a killer. People are picking up the fact he's reacting in a way that's not normal. Yes, we're showing grief. Yes, we want to show real grief. We get that. But this motherfucker talking about dance with me and shit. Like, the, like these psychotic episodes he has, it makes people think there's more happening with this character. Maybe there's something that happened before she died, or maybe he's the reason she died. That's he, Him and the fucking psychiatrist are neck and neck as far as I'm concerned when it comes to suspects. Yeah, <laughs> before I ask about the chewing gum, the agent shoes. Jesus. This show is terrible. Dinah here. Dinah here's a terrible show. <laughs> What was I thinking as a kid? Like, I used to like this shit. She just said, do you think there could ever be a movie about this? Hmm. I wonder. <laughs> but, see, again, that shows the attitude back then. TV is great. Oh, this is great. You have this little TV show. That's so cool. It's so cute you have this little TV show. When are you going to do something real? Like a movie. That was the attitude back then, right? Man, has that changed. Damn. The Shade. He says, well, you know, there was a Dallas movie years ago that did about 50 cents at the box office. God damn. Whoosh. <laughs> How's that taste, Larry Hagman? Yeah, are we ever going to find out who killed the deer? <laughs> They're saying this show's like Peyton Place? I've never even heard of Peyton Place. What the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, I don't know. That's before my time, I guess. Well, that was great, man. I will say that that was great. It was it was a great flashback to the times past. It reminded me that you can't go back and watch shit you used to enjoy as a kid. I, I've often thought, should I go back and watch Buck Rogers or, um, you know, Airwolf or Knight Rider? No, I should not. I should leave those as a fond memory because I'm sure in reality they sucked tons of ass. Case in point. But yeah, a lot of interesting stuff here. And, uh, but I'm not going to wait any longer. I'm going to jump into the, the final season finale.